Severance is a weird and amazing piece of television, and it works on so many levels. Probably the easiest for me to comment on is its commentary on corporate culture. Though there are very much deeper levels to the show, and we might get into that at some point, mainly I just loved this series and I really wanna talk about it. Now having said that, I slept on the show for quite a while until a friend gave me this synopsis. It's a show about a guy who signs up to have his memory wiped every time he goes into work. Now I've been working in the corporate world for well over 15 years and the psychology of the workplace is something I love to talk and think about. Chief of all of that is the seemingly very real human trait of compartmentalizing our lives. You have the you that you are. That's the you that loves your dog, loves your blanket, loves your spot on the couch, your car, your hobbies, all of the things that are uniquely you. But then you have a very real version of you that also exists that's the work you, a version of you that cares about things that the other you couldn't care less about. It's embarrassing, but uh, it's my first time training and I must have just forgotten to go over data smuggling rules with Ellie. This you has its own routines, plans their day around a calendar of meetings, deadlines, and emails. This version of you would say things that the outside version of you never would. This version of you gets pissed at coworkers for things that, let's be honest, would probably take 20 minutes just to explain the intricacies of to an outsider. Now, the first time that I realized compartmentalization was a thing is when one of my work friends, who I laughed and goofed around with every single day, we played ping pong, we went on extended lunches, we talked sports, politics, inner office politics, and we got stuff done together until one day he just didn't show up. This was unexpected and it was a bit weird. And I found out later that he was in a rehab facility and his addiction had cost him his job, his family, and it almost cost him his life. I didn't know he was having a hard time. I didn't need to know. His business was his business and it was none of mine. And the workplace is where you leave your business behind for the sake of company business. So hearing the premise of Severance, I was absolutely fascinated. And I can say that if you have any interest in this series, you need to stop this video and go watch it. I'm not going to give a recap of the show, but we are going to get into some of the later plot developments, which will ruin the experience for you a bit. So get that sweet seven day free trial from Apple TV plus activate your three month subscription. You got like when you did your last iPhone upgrade or, you know, just pay them the $10 to access it for a month own while you're at it. Watch Ted Lasso. It's fantastic. Uh, from here on, we're going to get into spoiler territory. So that's your last warning. <laughs> Turning on the first episode of Severance, I was instantly gripped. The opening shot of a woman laying flat on top of a table in what looks to be a late 60s conference room with someone asking through a very retro-ish intercom. Who are you? And with that first frame, with the colors, the lighting, the sound, the situation, all of it nestles Severance kind of unexpectedly for me into the mystery genre. The situation is begging you to ask, what is happening? And that puzzle assembly will be the experience throughout the series. But unlike Lost, what's in the box is not what gripped me. Because it's not long until the main plot device is introduced. I had previously assumed incorrectly that this was going to be a show in which every day the characters would simply have their minds wiped from the hours of 8 to 5. And then we'd never really see what happened inside the office. The quest or the mystery then would be a show about what are they doing down there? Which while the show does fixate on that as one of its mysteries in the box, the real compelling psychoanalytical piece presents itself with a subtle face change and personality change along with a neat camera trick in the elevator. And you realize while the outside version or the Audi is ignorant to what happens inside the office, the inside version or the any is ignorant to everything on the outside. Their mind is similar to someone with amnesia. The neurons are still there, but any of them related to their Audi's identity are completely wiped. Physically, they're the same person, but the any is now taking on an identity of their own. When they clock out at five, their experience is regaining consciousness at eight in the morning, as though no time has passed at all. They're always on, never out of pocket, vacation time isn't a thing, clocked in, each and every moment of their existence. And their Audis have the reverse experience. It makes for a really interesting setup for the writers to play with how we compartmentalize our lives. This brings up the fascinating question that the series plays with throughout its first season. If an innie and an Audi exist, which is the real person? I give consent. 
for my perceptual chronologies to be surgically split, separating my memories between my work life and my personal life. Bringing it into our world, we compartmentalize our lives in a lot of different ways. Be it your personality at the office, the gym, your place of worship, where you volunteer, and who you are with your significant other. Maybe it has to do with how you are when you have a lot of money versus how you behave when you have no money. If we present ourselves differently in each circumstance in our life, quickly the thesis becomes clear, which version of you is the real you? Who are you? For example, let's take a look at our main character. Audi Mark is free of the burden of experiencing work which actually provides for his sustenance. On the surface, that sounds kind of fantastic, getting paid to do nothing. But Severance asks the question, who would actually undergo a procedure to forget the majority of our waking hours? When I think about not having to work for the rest of my life, it's always in a I won the lottery situation. I'm gonna go live on a mountain and just be one with nature. I don't know, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna go live on a mountain town and live the simple life or something. And then on the weekends, would you hacky sack back to reality and spend time with your wife and kids? Whoa. Nevertheless, Mark isn't free to go gallivant the universe and become a hippie. He spends his free time doing the same things that the rest of us do to relax from a hard day of work. Television, seeing family on the weekends, all of the normal kind of boring stuff, except this is his life, that's it. Tethered to a job which brings him no purpose, no dignity, or identity. He's lost in his grief, barely making his way through life. So he's never really finding himself, he's just kind of lost in distraction. Who are you? And this drab, isolated Audi life is juxtaposed to the innie's perspective. Every day for any Mark is full of light, it's full of life brings new challenges, a new mystery, a new experience of some sort. And he's assumed that this life they're living is the same as everyone else's experience. They know something's different, but to them, this is all they know, so it's normal. They're learning their jobs, they're learning their strengths and weaknesses, they're learning their desires. All of it is untethered to the question, Who are you? Humans are social creatures. We signal to one another that we identify with our family, our religion, our ethnic groups, our socioeconomic backgrounds, our political parties, our political movements, our trade, or even the company that we work for, all in a pursuit a feeling safe in numbers, right? A reminder to the rest of society that, hey, I'm here too, and don't forget about me. I'm important. It seems to be something that's biologically wired into each one of us. Through our upbringing though, we receive messages from people all around us, each group demanding a bigger and bigger piece of that identity pie from you to the point that we no longer incorporate those things into our identity, but we begin to place our identity into those things. Which begs another question. What traces of us would actually be left if we severed from the things that we take our identities in? Religion, politics, families, wealth, trauma, work. Would you be the same person? Would you be kinder? Would you love the same people? Would you even recognize you if you never had interference from those social groups? Now in the show, Lumen is a very real company in their world, but from a writing standpoint, the commentary is clear that there are forces out there which by their very existence and our voluntary agreement, they demand and we voluntarily give our identity, we get in line and we advance their bottom line. Whether their bottom line is saving souls, getting votes, or like a literal bottom line. And this isn't new, humans have been capitalizing on one another for our entire history. It's just the tactics have changed. We've given up chains for a paycheck. We're complacent as long as there's smiles, optimism, and a promise of a brighter future. So that's why I say Severance works on so many levels. Take everything we're gonna talk about with Lumen, a corporation in this show, but apply it to social groups, especially religion and politics, and all of this is gonna hold true. But let's go where the show takes us first. Corporate culture demands the best of us, the best of our brain power, our ingenuity, our problem solving skills, our labor, our skills, and most of all, our time. While expectations in the workplace have evolved significantly, like every generation, all the more in the last like three or four years, because the last three or four years have been crazy, companies are still actively enacting policies and strategies to get every drip of productivity from you. And if you aren't in the know about this, then what I'm about to say is 
gonna sound extremely conspiratorial, but depending on the size of the corporation that you may work for, there are entire teams that are devoted to figuring out how to get you to voluntarily give up more of yourself to the company. If your company is smaller, rest assured, they've either paid agencies for their expertise in this field, or at least someone high up enough thinks that they've watched enough TikTok videos to figure it out. Now, these tactics have worked pretty well though. Performance-based rewards, bonuses, the office architecture, culture of an organization, and yes, even indoctrination are all part of the strategy. All of this creates a dangling carrot dragging us forward and tempting us to give inch after inch of our energy, our time, and even our identity. Employees are led with vapor, but the work powers very real results for the company. And no, not my company. I can hear like one person saying, they love me. Lumen is benign and innocuous on the surface. Everyone gets called by their first names and last initial. They get rewards and parties. And yet, Lumen is demanding and somewhat sinister under the surface, which is embodied by the Ennies handler, Mr. Milchek, played by Tramel Tillman, best known for playing Mr. Milchek. Good man. The point is, I don't actually think any company is immune to this. It's in all of their best interest. Now I'd say that most are not as alarming or evil as maybe what's depicted in the show, but that's the point. Like most companies, Lumen has a vested interest in keeping those any employees productive and happy. While the ominous truth is, for all intents and purposes, those employees are slaves. Oh, I, I don't like that word. While creating a working prison for these innies, Lumen doesn't present it as much on the surface. Again, begging the question, who are you? While the management of Lumen is casual with their any staff, referring to them as their first name accompanied with their last initial, that does seem to be more about restricting the any's ability to derive any potential family, ethnic, and or historical national identity from that name, and yet makes the any feel personally addressed. Management, however, is always referred to with their title and their last name only. While normal workers can simply be fired for poor performance, these severed employees have an entirely different experience. Being fired is akin to non-existence. Instead, to keep employees in line, they are punished psychologically, being forced to undergo hours of reading statements of confession and thankfulness until the employee seems to truly believe it for themselves. Confession, by the way, which reads very much like apology tweets after a celebrity or company gets canceled. The fact that these severed employees are a blank slate, meaning the indoctrination of their youth and life and experiences are all stripped away, the innies are given a sense of purpose and direction and virtues with these sessions, along with the employee handbook, something that's written with very biblical language and even, you know, kind of looks like a Bible. And now in each swing of your axe or swipe of your pen, the sun. Nevertheless, the innies are inundated with messages about the Lumen values, the core principles that every employee should take, some of which I'm gonna admit, I had to Google just to even know what they meant. If you work for a corporation and you don't have cultish behavioral statements that you see regularly, then this all may be lost on you. But for the rest of us, Truly this hits home. And speaking of home, the show has a lot to say about this home away from home. Soft colors meant to soothe the psyche, statements on the wall meant to inspire, looming parties meant to curtail intrusive thoughts, hard work pays off with satisfying the cravings of the flesh, vending machines giving the illusion of choice, all commentary on real world equivalents. The halls of Lumen are all nondescript. There's no map, no signage, only small plaques for each department or special room. Now, there are a lot of meanings to this, but it does invoke the days of old giant office buildings creating floors of cubicle labyrinths, all of which does bring me back to existential crises I used to have as a kid. Do you ever like see a group of, maybe I'm the weird one here, do you ever see a group of ants going all over the place, but for a moment, just like pick one of them and follow that ant and watch what it does? It seems busy, but like, does it have a purpose? Does it know why it's doing what it's doing? Or is it doing it because it's just what it's supposed to do? I mean, the ant seems to know where it's going, but the how and the why are not questions that it seems to be burdened with. So assume for a moment that aliens are real and one decides from way up high to just follow me on a normal day with my commute from home to the office, from the parking lot into the building, badging into the lobby, stopping for a cup of coffee, to my floor, to my wing, to my row, to my cube, 
where I sit for hours barely moving until it's time to just reverse the entire process. I'm just one of billions doing the exact same thing while the sun is up. Would an alien ask the same things of me that I ask of the ant? Does it know why it's doing what it's doing? Is it burdened with how and why questions? Do you know why you're doing it? Or are you just trapped in the labyrinth of work? Ever notice that like casinos don't have windows? They're just mazes of glitz and glamor with limitless possibilities and no sense of the outside world. All of it is strategically designed designed to get you to lose your sense of identity while you're in there so that you give more and more of yourself to the house. And just like there's teams of psychologists and sociologists consulting casinos on the best layouts and designs to trap people inside, that's very much a thing in corporations, teams of people dedicated to creating environments productive to the company. One of my favorite examples of this, which has always piqued my interest, is that many companies realized that the modern culture was evolving and the cubicle style of workspaces are just, they're old and they're not trendy anymore. So, and they just don't encourage much collaboration. And not to mention you can fit many more desks in the same space if you reduce all of the employee's workspace down to just a single desk. So a lot of companies got to work on tearing down all their walls, replacing them with these hip, trendy, collaborative areas to work in. They call it open workspace. But an unexpected consequence happened. No one liked to talk in these offices. It turns out that people were less social in these environments, and it all came down to it was way too quiet. Without the walls breaking the noise, Nobody liked to speak up. They were less inclined to break the silence. They weren't collaborating because the silence was deafening. This was very much opposite of the goal that they were trying to achieve. There's also other issues of Phyllis from 30 feet away being way too loud, annoying everyone, and reinforcing them to stay quiet and silent like a good employee. Seriously? Okay. This is unacceptable. It's officially a hostile work environment. But overall, it was mostly the silence was blocking collaboration, experts got together to figure out how to fix this. So could they add more amenities, like more water coolers to spur the social stuff, add ping pong tables and all the other cool, hip, trendy stuff just to make people feel more comfortable in the workplace? They tried a lot of things and none of that worked. There was one single simple fix that changed everything. These corporations were able to deal with a psychological impediment to production with one small little fix, and I love this, they installed speakers in the ceilings, which put out white noise sounding like air vents. And the decibel level is low enough that it doesn't warrant a second thought from an employee. Most of them don't even know it's there. They just assume it's the air vents, but the decibel level is high enough to reduce the intimidation an employee feels to speak up and in the open air environment to their teammates. And it also drowns out Phyllis down the way. What the hell? It's okay, guys. It all sounds very conspiratorial, but it's legit. Like, this is a real thing. You can Google it. I think of things like this while I'm watching Severance because it reminds me that there's always someone behind the curtain pulling levers to draw as much of you to their cause as possible. Just think of the scramble that companies are undergoing right now to figure out how to get people to come back into the office after the pandemic. Now in the show, Lumen exhibits this level of thought on the severed floor. The MDR space, for example, itself feels like it's on the cusp of expanding. That is because the place is giant and there's only four workstations. Now the series has a subplot with Lumen investing in harvesting more people to sign up for the severance procedure, but the commentary here does feel like the very real tease of expansion, which is always on the horizon. The thing dangled in front of countless people that you're on the ground floor of something really big. Just wait until this stuff gets going and you're going to be going places by joining us so early and being a team player. And whether or not severance ever shows us an MDR department, which is packed full of severed employees or not. I, I don't really know where the series is going to go, but I think the intention here is just another brick in the wall to placate the workers into an inflated sense of pride and importance of their work. Work, which, while a very Lost-esque mystery, really on one level just seems to represent that at the end of the day, we're all just putting numbers into bins. Employees are told that their work matters. That as a whole, we're pushing the needle forward impacting the stock price and changing the world. 
but at the end of the day, our contribution is intangible. You go home, it's not like you can easily explain what you did that day. Even sometimes it's unrecognizable to people outside of our specific department. Theories are all over the place on what caused the interdepartmental war between the MDR and the O&D, and if an excursion ever even existed in the first place, which we may not ever get to the answer to that, but the pitting of departments, business units, and even employees against one another is a common tactic by companies in order to get the best out of the employees. A competition does have a dirty underbelly, but it delivers the best and the brightest up to the top and equally displays the reverse underperforming outliers. Competition is and always will be a tool corporations use, especially to understand the motives of the employee. Taking a look at MDR, we can see how the company identifies each employee's motives in order to capitalize on them. Dylan performs the best out of everyone in MDR, and yet he's simply satisfied with waffle parties, finger traps, and other fleeting pieces of swag and experiences. And from what I recall, he doesn't say a cross word about the promotion going to Mark. And that's because early on, he's still distracted by the rewards he's receiving. Now these rewards do really matter to him, but seemingly only in a way that getting that toy that you always wanted when you were a kid kind of mattered. It matters until you have it. And and it's just on to the next thing. Throughout season one, Dylan's motivation is broken only once he sees the futility in what the company's actually offering versus what his Audi has. Irving, on the other hand, is driven by a sense of pride and duty. It's important to him to perform his best because he believes in the job, he believes in the company, and he believes in his founder. Irving, out of everyone else, has put his entire identity into Lumen, which also seems to be something that he shares with his Audi. He's only disillusioned once he witnesses the company acting in a way that is contrary to their own values. Mark's any and Audi's behavior throughout the first season would imply that he's not really able to reconcile the reality that he's experiencing. Audi Mark can't move on from the past, and any Mark has similar feelings. Both of them are driven only to make sense of their world, yet neither has the tools to do so. Audi Mark relies on severance and alcohol to pass the time in a fleeting existence. Any Mark seems to think that meeting expectations of his bosses, keeping the status quo, is the secret to success. He struggles with understanding Heli at first as she sees things quite differently from him. Mark wants so badly for his reality to make sense even if he knows that something's off. His innies motives, therefore, are similar to Irving's motives, both want to please Lumen, but differ in so much that Mark's self-value is based on how his bosses see his output and Irving simply finds his value by contributing to Lumen's mission. Mark is disillusioned with Lumen when he finds a book written by his Audi's brother-in-law, a semi-successful author whose self-help book is full of hokey tweet size advice bits that could possibly be summed up best in memes. It's revolutionary though for these characters. It's like eye-opening and life-changing words. Words that would set him free to see the captivity that he's living in. And Heli is not meant for this world any Heli specifically. She's disillusioned from day one, but her rebelliousness seems to correlate to what we find out about her later in the series. She's an Egan. She's literally not meant for this world. Her any strong-headed persona is a carryover from her Audi's genes. She's an heiress to the Egan fortune and Lumen's destiny, and the rebellion that Heli R exhibits might very well reflect the duality that someone in that high of a profile upbringing might actually experience. This exchange with her father might even reveal that her severance might not have even been her own idea, something that she's not very happy about. After all, nothing in this video screams anything except you need to rebel. Now, whether I'm correct about Audi Heli's motives or not, that's all going to get revealed in future seasons, but the show seems to be very much suggesting that compartmentalization is truly not possible. Your identity will always bleed over. Irving's Innie clearly has some trauma associated with this door. That trauma is locked into the human and manifests itself into the Audi's obsession with Lumen and the door. And the Audi's obsession then bleeds back over into Irving's Innie experience. But this duality bleed over is seen in less dramatic ways. When watching the first episode, I thought, what year is this set in? The very first shot gives me some very 60s vibes, 
but the car that Mark is driving gives me a very 80s vibe. In fact, most of the cars in the show have a very retro feel to them, as does Mark's sister's home. The technology in the office feels wildly outdated. There is no escape button. These terminals with rounded edges are very 70s inspired. The control panel with the security room are as well. All of this changes though when Mark shows a cell phone out at dinner. And that and the implant is like future tech wizardry, which also works remotely. Pretty sure we can't do that. I guess also the resolution of the video capture and playback we see in the final episode is way better than any tech that would have used these machines that look like this. And I'm sure I'm missing things here. I even went back later and realized that Mark's phone is shown early in the first episode, right alongside his license, which I can't actually tell from the screen, but it clearly does say it's 2020 something. So why did Severance go out of its way to show a world bleeding decades worth of technology and design into each other? My guess is that the surreal and time confused nature of Audi Mark is a reflection of his innies perception of Lumen, a company with over a century of history, all of which bleeds into each other into different forms of media across those decades, all of which still strive to instill purpose and simultaneously consume as much identity from the individual as possible. Old ways meshed up with outdated philosophy candy coated to make it more digestible. Severance is a show that I couldn't stop thinking about for weeks. The implications for what it means for our identities and how we find identity in the workplace. It was all just too real, but also really enjoyable commentary. Honestly, it's fantastic. I can't wait for season two. Anything I missed while I was randomly working through my thoughts on the show, leave them in the comments. I am excited to do more content on this, so if you'd like that, leave a comment. Uh, any other workplace shows or films that you want me to take a look at next, too, leave them in the comments. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.